Starting yeah. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Australian Builders Declare's seventh webinar. Once again, my name's Simon Clark, one of the founders of Builders Declare and Director of Sustainable Homes in Melbourne. And I'll be your host for this evening. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we meet today. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Coming up, we have a presentation from none other than Builders Declare's go-to man, Jeremy Spencer, who will be breaking down what makes and breaks a high-performing home. Uh, before we get to that, I'll just run through some housekeeping and some upcoming news of Builders Declare. Uh, firstly, Builders Declare uh, obviously run an event each month, and next month we have another awesome uh, presentation. It's a presentation from Mark Thompson, who's director of Responsible Wood, uh, who champions sustainable forests in Australia and New Zealand. And he's also uh, architect and director of Eco Effective Solutions based out of Brisbane. So his presentation next month on April 14th is titled Sustainable Timber, the Australian Facts and Solutions for the Future. This, I'm sure some of you may remember Paul Haar's presentation from last year, rather polarising. So I look forward to this one from, from Mark and hopefully you can put a few more pieces of the puzzle together for us builders and, and professionals in the industry. And most of you will know, Builds Declare is founded by a small group of sustainable and high performing builders passionate about the homes we build and passionate about being part of the solution, not the problem when it comes to our climate uh, crisis. As mentioned at our previous presentation, we understand that a declaration is not enough and we need to, to facilitate real and tangible change. Therefore, Bill Seclair in 2021 will be working to better promote and educate the Australian building industry to a more sustainable future. Now we plan to do that through providing a resource that we're working on to help other builders and industry professionals build high performing sustainable homes. Uh, this resource will likely be a website, um, which we're really excited about creating and we hope to include lots of technical content, how to's from builders doing the work every day information sessions such as this one that can be stored on there as, as a resource uh, that can always be looked at and referred to. Uh, we plan to promote sustainable building materials that we endorse. So put uh, sustainable building materials through the ringer. We're all builders, we've all used them. Uh, rather than reinvent the wheel each and every time, you know, have some reviews on there that are actually from builders in the field. Uh, forum for problem solving. There's, there's lots of ideas circulating. We, we want to provide a path for people to offset their business and, and the homes that they're building, focused on construction and trade professionals. We are looking for sponsors to make this happen. We've, we've already got a few that are interested, but we'd love to uh, hear from anybody else uh, that wants to help out or knows anybody that does. Um, please feel free to email. Um, you can email us at info at billsdeclare.com. There's no AU on that. Or you could simply reply to the event um, email that you received here and I'll be on the other end of that. So that would be great to hear from you. So let's kick off today's event. What makes and breaks a high performing home? This presentation will focus on the important things to get right to achieve a high performance, low carbon home and what the common causes of failure to watch out for and avoid are. This is, a, this is a practical talk for builders, architects, and anyone wanting to know what the low hanging fruit to be picked during a building and what are the pitfalls to be avoided. So you can avoid low carbon and high performance, sorry, sorry, so you can achieve low carbon and high performance Nirvana. Mm -hmm. So Jeremy Spencer is our presenter this evening. Jeremy, again, Director, Builder and Energy Assessor for Positive Footprints, Sustainable Design and Construct. 
As well as that, Jeremy is also our technical guru amongst us founders of Builders Declare. A quick disclaimer, this the information you're about to receive is based on the experience of the presenter and may not relate to you or your situation. If you'd like more specific advice, please get in touch with us via email and we'll try our best to point you in the right direction or help you out. The event will run, oh, sorry, uh, Jeremy's presentation will run for about 45, 50 minutes. We'll have 15 to 10 minutes at the end to answer any questions you may have. Uh, please put your questions in the Q&A box down the bottom of your screen, uh, not in the chat box, because it, it just gets way too confusing in there. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay, let me just share my screen. <clears throat> All right, can you see a big round Builders Declare circle, Simon? Good to go, yep. Okay, good to go. <clears throat> Okie dokie. Um, I just uh, asked, can you see my pointer moving around on that circle or not? No, you can't. Let me, uh, no. let me just uh, get a highlighter, laser pointer. How about now? Now you can see something. All right. I might use that later on if I want to point to particular things. Can you see like a little circle, a laser pointer? Yep. Got it. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> All right, well, uh, look, welcome everybody um, to today's uh, webinar, what makes and what breaks a high performance home. Um, I was hoping that this webinar will be a very practical, um, a practical thing with hopefully some take home messages for everybody. Uh, I specialize in solar passive design and uh, typically I'll be using pretty conventional materials to achieve that. And so this um, really is, uh, hopefully for most builders, there will be something in, in this talk that um, will you know, help you get a little bit more out of the materials that you're using. Okay, so it's about um, what are the big ticket items to pluck as you go through the construction process and what are the pitfalls to avoid? Um, I should just start by saying that um, when I'm talking about high performance home, uh, I'm talking here simply about a house that is comfortable for clients, but very energy efficient, cheap to run and um, potentially zero carbon or very low carbon. So that's why I mean when I'm talking about high performance. I do understand that sustainability is much broader than that, but that's what today's talk is going to be on. Would you like a carbon zero home? So this is really where we need to get to as an industry that builders and designers for that matter are asking this question of their clients and are confident that they can deliver this for their clients. Um, you know, the world needs to move to a low carbon future and the building industry is one of the higher contributors to the carbon loads at the moment. So the onus is on us to do something about it. The good news is that the technology and the price points are right. Um, if you haven't already seen my, uh, my first talk, the roadmap to carbon zero homes, uh, that is up on the Builders Declare YouTube site, or you can find it on my website. Um, and that really gives the argument, I guess, for um, uh, zero carbon as something that is uh, cost effective and in fact uh, saves clients money um, now and obviously saves the environment a lot. Building industry and legislation are, are heading uh, this direction already with um, changes potentially to NATHERS, uh, whole of house um, and the trajectory for low energy homes. There's a huge potential savings for the environment and the, cl and, and the client for that matter. Um, just in Victoria, the average home produces eight tonnes of carbon dioxide um, through uh, emissions associated with the energy it uses um, and a carbon zero home effectively saves almost eight tonnes a year um, for the life of the house, not to mention the, uh, the cost of buying that energy for the client. Warmer, more resilient, quieter home. So these are all um, directions that things are heading. And what this leads to is a big opportunity for builders really um, to get 
in now to learn the systems and the processes and to upskill their team so that they can provide to the market a very low carbon option, um, which has all these benefits. However, with uh, big opportunity comes big responsibility. Um, you don't want to be in this position as a builder. You've uh, offered a whole lot. There you go, nine star home, and they come to you and say it's not good to be in. Uh, or um, it might be nice and comfortable inside, but look at the bills, right? So something has gone wrong in that situation. So again, that's what we're looking at today. So as we go through, you'll see on the slides a little apple that represents the low-hanging fruit to, uh, to grab as we move through the build process. And the other thing that you'll see is a little coyote. These are the pitfalls that you might want to avoid. Now, the place to start is the place I started the last talk um, as well, and that's really looking at where energy is used in the average home. So this is the average, uh, if you had new homes, existing homes, you average them all out. Um, this is the data that you get. And this comes from the residential baseline study in 2015 for Victoria. If you're outside of Victoria and watching this, um, if you go to this website, you can potentially download the data yourself and you can make your own nice little pie graph for your state. But it is good to know where your energy going in Victoria. And this will be the same, by the way, in, uh, in Tasmania and the ACT, most of your energy will be going to space conditioning. And most of that is into heating because we're in a climate where we need to heat most of the year. Um, and these other ones, water appliances and cooking, they're pretty um, static all through the states of Australia, a little bit of variation. Um, this pie, like I said, um, well, for Victoria, we have the dubious honour of being the uh, most carbon intensive uh, um, housing in, the, in, in Australia, mainly because of the uh, brown coal we burn in the grid. But the average house produces 8.8 .8 tonnes of carbon dioxide a year, has a combined electricity and fuel bill in Melbourne of 2,686, might have changed a little bit. This is a little bit old, this data. Um, and this represents the average house size of 200 square metres. All right. So what I'm going to, the approach I'm going to take here is to work my way around this pie, a little bit like the last talk, but in this one, it's going to be a little bit more practical what to do and what to avoid. Um, I should say at the outset, um, when I put together this talk, I actually found that there was a lot to say. And so this is actually going to be a two-parter. The first part uh, that you're seeing today is really looking at uh, construction and the shell and the fabric of the house. Um, and really this space conditioning side, how to minimize that uh, as a builder. Um, and then the next talk is really looking at the technology that goes in the house, which really looks at the other side of the pie and how to minimize that. So if you do like this webinar, look out for another one down the track. All right, so to minimize space conditioning, what are the big rocks? What are the, what are the, the apples to grab here? So there's basically three main things. The first one is do a good design. And when I'm talking good design, this is a National House Energy Rating logo. So for most states in Australia, you have to achieve a six star minimum um, for your NatHERS uh, rating report. Uh, New South Wales has basics, so they have a slightly different system. But all this is, the number that you get here is just a relation uh, or, or it's just a score of how passive or solar passively designed um, the, the design is. That is how well it uses the climate that it's associated in to provide he its own heating and cooling before you have to bring in mechanical plant to do it. Um, so that's one, obviously one factor and makes a big difference. The other factor that goes along with that is construction that is of a quality and to meet the assumptions that the house energy rating software assumes. Um, so we've all heard the story of a, uh, a nine or 10 star home that's um, built in a two star way and it'll end up being a three star house. Uh, so construction is vital, important. And the other component that goes into this space conditioning wedge is the mechanical heating and cooling system that you use and the efficiency of that. 
All right. So the first big apple is passive solar design. Now, this talk is not about passive solar design. That's a whole nother topic I'm happy to do uh, at another time if anyone would like put your comments in the comment section if you'd like to hear that talk. Um, but for most builders, we often won't get an option. We just build the jobs that come along. Most builders aren't also involved in design. But if you aren't involved in design, this is the only slide to passive solar design, it makes sense. I would aim for at least seven stars. That's reasonably low bar um, to go for passive solar design, as long as you've got a, a bit of sunshine. And the other thing that I'd say that is vital to getting a high score is to go to one of these guys, a TPA, a thermal performance assessor. Go to them while the design is still fluid. Once you've maybe got your, just, just the design concept that you and the client are happy with, before you've done town planning, before you've done engineering, before you've done working drawings, before that design is locked into concrete, um, and too much water has flown under the bridge for any real changes. And ask that thermal performance assessor, what can I do to improve what is already my best passive solar design that I think will work? What else can I do? Um, and the, the, the thermal performance assessor will probably love you because 99% of the industry um, just use them for compliance purposes right at the end of the build. And all a, a TPA can do at that point is if the house isn't already at six stars, they can maybe bump up wall insulation. Um, and if that's still not at six stars, you start double glazing windows and that's pretty much it. But the software can do so much more. So anyway, that's the first big apple for you designers out there. All right. Now, if you do the minimum of a six star design, uh, compared to the average, which includes existing homes as well, if you can build it to that six star level with your building technique, you've already made a huge dent, you know, basically a quarter of that 8.8 .8 tonnes in Victoria or approximately two tonnes of, uh, of greenhouse gases you've just saved there and some cost for the client. And that's just working to the minimum. Um, which is easy to design, harder to build. So we'll get into that. Now, if you go further and you've got a design, you're lucky enough to have designed seven stars and you build to that, that has a bigger effect on space conditioning. Eight stars and even bigger. You've got a very small amount of energy now needed um, for that house. And nine stars, smaller again. And 10 stars is theoretically a house that needs no mechanical heating and cooling. Um, now, a lot of builders will be looking at this and thinking that'd be great if only a 10 star design or a nine star or an eight star would come across my desk. I would love to do that. Um, if you're that person, you should be linking up with um, some good sustainable architects and designers and uh, letting them know that that's your passion. And um, however, if you're like most builders, you'll be building a six star or a seven star house, but have no fear. Do not feel like, um, you know, there's no way that you can make a significant difference. Uh, the technology is such these days that technology has a huge impact on the rest of this pie, which we will get into perhaps more in part two. All right. So for builders, once you get a design across your desk um, and what you need to do is to fulfill the assumptions of the house energy rating. So at, a, at the very minimum, you need to meet the house energy rating assumptions. These are the house energy rating assumptions, which is good to go over because I bet no one's ever gone over them with you before. Um, the first one is, well, make sure that the following is on the rated stamped plans. Now, by rated stamp plans, you should see in the plans that you're about to build with a stamp like this to show that those plans are the plans that the went across the assessor's desk when he was looking at it. If you don't find a sticker like this or a stamp like this on your plans, stop what you're doing, go back to the designer, ask for the plans that have this stamp on it and go and check that nothing has changed from the stamp plans to the ones that you're going to construct because otherwise you are you know building outside the code really um, and if there is changes those plans will need to go back to the assessor 
for just a correction to the house energy rating. So the first step here is that house form and materials must be the same. So check your plans that the house form and the materials are as per um, the stamped plans. The next one is that the insulation is to the correct R. It's non-compressed throughout the build and it is complete. There are no gaps and cracks. So the house energy rating system assumes basically perfect install there. Um, we all know that that rarely happens on site. Uh, once again, those correct R values, they should be on the stamped plans. If they're not on the stamped plans, you can scan this little QR code here and you'll bring up the actual report and you can see what the house energy rater put in for the different wall types in the house. All right, the NatHERS assessment also assumes that there's no thermal bridging. So there's no weak points in the house. It assumes that the building is reasonably tight. So that's reasonably tight by NatHERS is the, the is 10 air changes or less um, per, per hour at 50 pascals of pressure, which is approximately equivalent to about a 30 kilometer an hour wind blowing over your house. Now I know um, those of you uh, who are listening who are into um, passive house construction will look at 10 air changes and say that that is a very easy bar to get under. Um, and the answer is yes, that is a very easy bar um, to get under. Unfortunately, as an industry, we are not. On, in general getting onto that and I'll, I'll show you a graph a little bit later. Um, you've got to check that the windows are as per the NG rating report and that lights and extraction fans and the electrical plan is actually as per the stamped plan. That's this stamp on the plan. So when you once you've checked that and you start your construction, the first apple, right, the first low-hanging fruit is really to think about the thermal shell. So as well as thinking about structure, as well as thinking about detailing, as well as thinking about aesthetics and function and you know schedules and costs and budgets, all those things that builders think about, think about the thermal shell as well. So your, the thermal shell is simply the external skin of the house through which you get you know, energy transfer between the inside and the outside of the house. And you're trying to maintain a comprehensive thermal shell so there's no weak points. What does that actually mean? It means that either you're standing in your frame when you've, once you've framed up and you're imagining heat flow and you're looking around, you're trying to work out where there's gonna be weak points or even better, you're doing that in your headspace when you're looking at your plans and your engineering and you're noticing, you know, yeah, the energy rating is called up an R4 bat. Is there actually enough space to put that R4 bat in with the engineering that uh, has been called up for this, you know, it's a 90 millimeter rafter. Can I get an R4 in that? No, is the answer. So thinking your thermal shell, trying to problem solve early on. So let's go through some thing, uh, some elements of the house. Floors. Um, so a lot of standard construction is using slabs and we use um, slabs. We use it uh, because slabs are a cost-effective way to spread thermal mass evenly throughout a house. Um, and they also have, uh, uh, that's beneficial because um, if you've got a bit of thermal mass in your house, it takes a long time for that to heat up and cool down. And so the outdoor temperature can be going up and down. It can be a bit erratic, but you'll get a, a much more constant um, temperature inside because of that slower um, uh, movement of the of the mass. The other thing, uh, the other reason that putting a little bit of mass tends to give you a higher performing home, not always, but tends to, um, is uh, especially now with um, uh, very cheap solar panels or relatively cheap solar panels and very efficient um, uh, heaters, so ef efficient reverse cycle air conditioners, is that you can treat that mass a little bit like um, a battery and you can, um, actually it's not particularly related to the rating, but it's related to the performance. Um, if you've got solar panels and you're producing that power, like on a day like that in winter, you can be heating your home and the concrete will actually be absorbing that uh, heat as well as the rest of the house. And when the sun goes down, you can turn off your heater and the house will stay, will retain that heat quite well. Um, the contrary will happen in winter and uh, you will retain your coolness quite well if you've been air conditioning during the day when you're making heaps of 
um, heaps of the power from the solar panels. Now, I write here, insulate slab as, as a bit of an apple. Now, obviously, you've got to follow the plans that you've got if you're a builder, but it's worth asking the engineer, um, can if there's no insulation, can we put some underneath? The reason being, it usually lifts the performance of the house by about half a star, um, simply because it delays the heat loss from the slab to the ground. Um, it just delays that process and it gives you even more of a lag so that it holds those temperatures deep into the night uh, rather than losing them quickly uh, from the house uh, once the sun goes down. So, um, But the other thing, the CSIRO recently came out with um, a little paper about groundwater and the effect of groundwater on the conduction beneath a slab and the performance of the house. So uh, if you've got groundwater, say a water table within five meters of the home, it has significant five meters depth of the house. It has a significant effect on how quickly heat is sucked out of your home. So a bit of insulation underneath a uh, slab um, does have a benefit. Um, and that's even considering the discussion we had last time about my misgivings uh, of end of life and uh, uh, polystyrene mixed up with con concrete and recycling. Uh, even with all that, I still think the performance benefit is worth it and definitely the comfort benefit. All right, that was the good thing about slabs. The downside of slabs, here's, here's a downside. If you have a slab like this where you've got a very high edge, you can see it's high edge, and often you'll have that because of, uh, I think in this case, it was a flood prone area um, or near a beach uh, with um, sea level rise and that sort of thing. Anyway, either way, you can see it's got high side. Now, you can imagine a frame going on this and insulation going in that frame. And the house can be designed and, and insulated really well. But at night time, you might get five degree temperatures outside. You might get zero degree temperatures outside and those slab edges will get very cold and they will just suck heat out through the side of the slab and out. Um, and here, um, by the way, this, this no doubt will be a very aesthetically and beautiful house. Um, however, I have some misgivings about whenever this sort of thing happens where you've got an outdoor paved area directly butted against a concrete slab. Um, usually it's not detailed, usually it's on ground. Um, but I would always suggest you do it as a secondary pour if you can and put a bit of able flex in between as a thermal break. Otherwise, what again will happen at nighttime in winter, um, this whole area will get very cold and it will just suck heat out underneath what I assume will be some doors, uh, double glazed doors probably through there. Okay, so what's a solution to this to avoid, um, <laughs> avoid falling like coyote there? Uh, consider slab edge insulation. If you've got high slabs and you're doing a slab, um, you can explain to the owner the problem of losing heat out of the side of the slab and that over the life of the house, this will definitely be a, a good beneficial thing to do. Um, you can also feel it if you're on a concrete slab and you're walking around in bare feet, as I like to do on our polished slabs. Uh, you can feel it if you get to the near the edge of the wall that the temperature drops markedly if you don't have a bit of insulation in. Not so important if this is only a minimum freeboard of 200 mil, 150 mil, doesn't really matter. But when once it's getting high, um, heat loss is related to area of that, that that heat can get lost through. So that's when it becomes more important. What I've put on here is um, a bit of north insulation. I think it's north, maybe Knorf. Um, it's a 50 mil uh, climber foam, they call it. It's an R1.8 board. Uh, I've gone over the top here, it's in a termite zone. So this is just gone over with some termi mesh and then uh, we'll render that later. If you're doing uh, timber subfloors, um, this was a renovation, but if you're doing timber subfloors, if you've got some plans and it doesn't show insulation under there, if you possibly can get under there, it will always improve the rating substantially, at least a star usually. Um, by getting under there and insulating. And if it's not on your plans, but you can do it, most owners will be up for a variation because most people have lived on timber floors and know what cold timber floor is like. So um, what do I use? I, I Typically I'll, I'll use uh, green stuff, um, insulation. It's got some recycled content, it comes in a nice long roll, a bit easier. It's not, um, it's not a fiberglass, so it's not itchy. It's a bit easier for my guys to use underneath um, underneath the house. 
Uh, R2.5 or 3, if you go much over that, uh, the benefits start reducing um, uh, or not paying themselves off in the house energy rating simulations. All right, let's look at external walls. So the first defence um, to unwanted air ingress into your home through your walls is the reflective foil or the membrane that you use. And uh, it's good to see more and more often you get the situation where you're starting to see foil being taped, foil being lapped properly. Um, I still see it not always taped to the windows, properly not always taped to the doors, but you're trying to just create a monolithic facade so that there's less spots for the air to get in. Now, this is my first offence rather than my cladding because claddings are typically have a lot of gaps and cracks to them and they're not made to be airtight in any way. And as a general rule, I like to batten off my cladding anyway so that it can breathe on the backside. Um, uh, just helps prolong the life of the building. It also gives, um, if I've got a reflective foil like this and the blue side is also reflective in reflective foil, not quite as much as the silver side, but it still has a reflective component. And whenever you've got reflective foil onto an airspace, you get approximately another half an hour rating. So um, in your wall. So anyway, that's, that's how I build. Now I've got down here um, just a note. Uh, so your, your vapor barrier is doing a couple of things. One that's stopping direct air being blown in, but it's also, Typically, you want to choose one that allows the wall to breathe. So anywhere below the tropics, so definitely in the southern half of Australia, what you want is you want your walls to be able to breathe. So if they do get wet inside, if you've got leaks, they wet the inside, um, those leaks can dry off and it doesn't lead to rotting. Um, more importantly, perhaps, is once you've actually finished this wall and finished this house and people are living in there, they're breathing, they're showering, they're cooking. Uh, and in our climate, the indoor air is typically more moist than the outdoor air. And so you get a movement of moisture through gaps and cracks into the wall cavity. And partway through that wall cavity, what happens is the temperature of that moisture laden air uh, at, on nighttime in winter, it'll get colder and colder and colder and often can get to a point where it's condense down and you get a dew point and the water condenses out and you get dripping inside your cavity. So you want a facility for those walls to um, breathe on and allow that humid air through. And if they do get wet, that they allow once the sun comes up the next day and the wall heats up that, that, that moisture can evaporate, um, evaporate away. Um, the other thing that membranes, some membranes are doing, they'll also have a water, um, they'll also act as a water barrier. And potentially if you're a clever builder, you could be starting construction on the inside maybe um, before you even finish your cladding because you're working uh, with a water barrier. Here's a, a nice little idea. Um, if you just uh, typically run your foil from bottom to top plate, you will get gaps at the top um, where air can come in over the top of the eaves and down the wall. So this is just a little idea of running a starter strip. Yeah, you can see a picture of it here. Um, that can just be put on as you're doing the framing. Later on, once the framing's done, you can then you know, stick to that or, or use that as a start and that sort of closes that gapping up the top. I do wanna point out here um, where I'm circling at the moment, this detail is wrong. You should always make sure your upper, upper foil is lapped over the outside of your lower foil in tape in case the tape breaks over time. Um, I'm also a little bit dubious uh, about this particular detail going in underneath the wall. Definitely don't do that if you have a slab. Um, yes, not good, but I wouldn't know. All right, uh, next slide. So that's the first part of the barrier. Um, the next part in your walls to get right, to build um, a high performance home, or at least a home that is performing to the star rating is to put insulation in, in a non-compressed manner to the right R value. And if you look at this wall, this looks lovely, but uh, the builders out there will be noticing that the, the studs are very uneven, obviously carrying different loads or picking up um, uh, claddings or whatever on the outside. They're not running at easy 450 centers. Each one of these bats has been cut to fit. 
right? So they haven't just been jammed in and compressed in that process. And if you look down the middle here, um, you know, someone's gone and actually put it nicely into that small gap. I might foam that with an expansion foam. Um, but either way, this is what the software assumes, right? So it's worthwhile telling your installers to slow down and paying them, you know, a few hundred bucks extra to do that. Most installers these days get paid per square meter. And so they do as fast as they can. And that's just a recipe for a slapdash job. So explain to them there's a high performance house um, and just get them to do job, you know, in a proper manner. Uh, if you don't, this is a very common scenario. Um, here you can see this is uh, an image taken with a thermal imaging camera, uh, which are excellent to get. And you can see the warm sections of the house, 19.8 uh, degrees C in, in these uh, orange sections. But you can see it gets very cold uh, in the black and the purple. And what's happening here, um, maybe these bats haven't been quite pushed to the top plate there. And maybe these ceiling bats have not been overlapped over the top plate. Now, it's, this is quite common, especially when if you have a situation where you've got rafters that pitch onto the top plate there. Um, if those are only 90 millimeter rafters, uh, say in a truss sort of situation, you might not have very much space actually directly above that plate. And the R rating might have been called up as, you know, might be an R4, might be an R6 for that matter. You know, you, you might, might technically need 300 millimeters of lofts of space up there to actually maintain the loft in the insulation. Um, and you, you won't be able to do it. So these are the sort of thing that I was talking about to think about the structure and how you're going to maintain. What you might need to do in that case is you might to need to get some uh, denser foam boards perhaps and put them um, along the perimeter of, of the house to maintain whatever the R rating is that you had to maintain. The other thing that you might need to do is to bump up the R rating in the other bit to compensate for um, the less R rating around the edges. It's a bit tricky uh, to do that, and uh, you might need the house energy radar to, uh, to help you make that assessment of what you need to do. Um, the other thing to note here, you can see the dark, uh, the, the blue coming down the walls. Now, I bet that there's bats in those walls, but you know they might only be R1.5 bats, They're not filling up the whole cavity. And so you've got the air just draining down the cavity and making that plaster cold. That'll be a very cold corner to be in. So I always like to maximize my, 90, my typically 90 millimeter cavity space with um, an R2.7 or an R2.5 bat that, that is 90 millimeters thick when it's fully lofted so that it tries to stop those sorts of flows of unwanted air through the structure. Uh, this is another thing I do if I've got eaves sticking out to, to stop the, the cold breezes coming through, um, coming through the eaves. Uh, I just get half a bat and just squash into the space. Now, is this going to be as good as doing, um, you know, passive house wraps inside? No, it's not going to be that tight, but it'll be a lot tighter than having nothing there and then your eave sheet on the outside and air just getting in between uh, the gaps in the soffy there. Um, the other thing to note here is uh, I've got a can here of expanding foam. All of your penetration, so all of, all, sorry, all of your door and wall openings, um, the frame, there always has to be a gap between the actual door or window and the house frame itself. Now, usually that is just a, left as a gap. And so that represents a weakness in your insulation. And um, uh, a number of years ago, the CSIRO came out with a, uh, a statement that if you have 5% of holes, your insulation value drops by 50%. I'm not sure that number's exactly right, but it does derate very quickly if you've got holes. And the gap, if you added up all these gaps around windows and doors throughout a house, you'll easily have a square meter of hole um, that's just uninsulated. So get some expanding foam, blow that into the gaps, uh, make sure it's a low density so that it still allows the movement differential that is needed in there. Um, and then, you know, trim that off. And that's a, a good job for a, for an apprentice or a, you know, carpenter to, to get into. All right. Here's another um, pitfall. <laughs> 
So you get your insulation uh, people to come install your insulation. R2.7 to the walls, you're doing really well. You know, you're maximizing your 90 millimeter space and then they do the ground floor and they go upstairs and they do the upper floor and off they go. Uh, and then you take a photo like this. And this is extremely common where the joists, um, that rim, rim of around the joist is just left uninsulated completely. So obviously they, this house will just be hemorrhaging um, heat during winter and probably uh, gaining a whole lot of heat, unwanted heat. Not only that, if there's no insulation in there and there's gaps and cracks, you're going to get cold air potentially coming into that cavity space and sort of squishing throughout the house and uh, cooling the plaster and it's, it's, it's going to be a nightmare. So uh, what I would always suggest, get some insulation, put it in um, between the joists up there. Uh, I tend to also like to fill up my joist cavity. Uh, I use an R4 bat typically, maybe an R5, depending on the depth that I've got to fill. And, and that's partly to stop sound, partly to stop stratification of um, heat rising quickly to the upper floors. Um, but mostly actually to stop if there are gaps and cracks um, in my membranes, that it then becomes hard for breezes to blow through the house. They have to, you know, really try. <laughs> All right, another um, potential um, pitfall where your house could be let down in its thermal performance is through the studs. This is a, a typical Australian stud corner. Um, it's got that secondary stud there just to pick up your internal linings. Uh, but you'll notice that there's a stud hole missing just there. Now, Typically, you'll frame up and then you'll put uh, your reflective foil on, you'll put your cladding on around the outside, uh, you'll do your rough ends of your wires and your pipes, and then you'll put your bats in. But at that stage, it's just impossible to actually insulate into this gap. And actually, in practice, often you will see a gap. It won't be quite as tight as that. You'll actually see a physical gap into there and you wish you could insulate in, but you can't. And you'll just get potential breezes blowing in through there instead. Uh, much better idea to use a three stud corner, a Canadian corner, some people call it, where you can tuck your insulation behind or just fill up uh, that space with an extra stud when you're doing your framing. Another typical weak point that I'm always having to induct my insulation installers about, because they always send somebody different to, uh, to install, is power points. Electricians do not need holes cut out behind power points. Um, I've checked this with a couple of electricians. It makes it a little bit easier for them to do their wiring, but there's no need to do that. And it's definitely a bad thing, especially on external walls. Uh, with a gap like this, this should probably be foam filled as well. So just make sure you induct your, um, you know, your insulation installers that they don't need to do that practice. Uh, having said that, if you're dealing, sorry, if you're dealing with old wiring, the black stuff, that stuff can overheat. So if it's a really old house, um, you know, check with an electrician before you go ahead with that. But uh, as far as I'm aware, the white cable is fine to have in contact with um, insulation. All right, uh, in a roof space, uh, this is another spot of potential leakage. Um, here we have a, a skylight with um, plaster shaft, but we've insulated around it. But if we'd just left that as plaster, the roof space gets really cold, it gets really hot. It would warm or cool that plaster and that would pass on and down into the house below. So make sure you insulate with the ceiling insulation, your, um, your skylights. Likewise, if you have a roof, uh, a, a little dummy wall or a dwarf wall into a roof space, you should run whatever you use for the roof insulation that should go up that wall, up through the rafters. Um, don't just leave that as plaster or else that room won't perform well. You've got a weak point in that um, thermal shell. Uh, this is a manhole. Make sure you insulate manholes. Don't just leave it as a cut piece of plaster that can just slide around there. And also put a little bit of weather stripping around the gasket there. So it's a nice tight join. All these little things add up. Uh, this is a typical bugbear um, of mine, though things are starting to change. So th this is a roof, and this is very typical, a uh, roof with downlights. You can just see the, the, the round circles. Um, those are downlights. Now, in the past, at least, to install downlights, 
uh, electricians were required with halogen downlights to remove insulation from around those downlights um, by 50 mil. But of course, no one measures and cuts. What they do is they'll do their cutout, they'll reach their hand up into the cavity, they will grab and then they'll pull. And as you can see, you can quite easily pull out almost half a bat uh, doing that process. Means you won't have a fire, which is good, but it completely ruins your insulation to that roof space. Luckily, the fashion has changed and I really recommend pendant lights that hang down. You need a lot less of them to light up the same space. You have a very small hole where the wire comes through and uh, you can run your insulation straight over. If you have a plan though, and it has down lights in it and the owners don't want to change, talk to them about it. But if they don't want to change, then make sure you use a down light with an LED down light, first of all, with an IC or an ICF rated um, down light, which says abutted and covered or has a symbol like this to show that you can have insulation over the top of it. And then also induct your electrician that don't pull out, you know, um, don't, don't go and pull insulation. Of course, you, you might have to really help them or make sure when you're doing the plastering that you pull the wires out um, on the right side of that insulation and that it's easy for the electrician to get the wire if you want them not to muck around with your insulation. This is another common pitfall area. This is all standard standard construction, which I'm sure everyone's very familiar with who, who builds in standard ways. But if I've got, say, there's a flat frame ceiling, there's my 190 rafter maybe, maybe it's 240. Uh, Typically, I'll probably put an R4 bat in there and I've got an R1.8 building blanket on top of that. So what's that? 5.8 R of insulation. So pretty well insulated. But look, you come along here to where the box gutter is and you don't have as much space. Now, either you can press the insulation down, in which case it's no longer achieving its R4 uh, status, or once again, you're looking at um, a denser product, you might use a, a dense wall bat or a couple of layers of R2.7 or something might fit in there into that space. But these are the things you should be thinking about when you're thinking about your structure. Here's another image from my uh, thermal camera. This is before plaster has gone up, by the way, so you're not magically seeing through the plaster here and the insulation. But what you can see is really hot sections and cold sections. The cold section is the underside of the reflective foil. So that's doing its job well. But look at the roof battens. These roof battens here, uh, they are metal top hat roof battens connected directly to the roof above through the roof blanket and metal conducts really well. So effectively my R1.8 blanket in that case is um, short circuited. Uh, I mean, I still, if this was my job, <laughs> uh, I would still have an R4 bat in there. So we've still got plenty of insulation, but um, this, once I saw a picture like this, I've just made sure that we always use timber roof battens just to get um, away from steel because steel conducts 10,000 times better than timber. Just a little tip. Um, of course, if you've got a steel frame, you are potentially in trouble. Now, steel frames have a lot of benefits. They are recyclable. They are termite resistant. You know, they've got, they've got things going for them. But uh, if I was building with this, I wouldn't want to be putting plaster on one side and then um, clad directly on the outside. All the, uh, the heat flow will just bypass any insulation you manage to get in these strange little uh, triangly bits. So in that case, you'd be wanting to put insulation on the outside and definitely have thermal, uh, you know, a thermal break between this frame and whatever's going on on the outside. Looks like it's a brick, a brick veneer. So there will be a bit of a thermal break, but still I'd want a nice big cavity so that I could put some, um, um, maybe some foil board or some Kingspan product on the outside. Uh, and this sort of thing I see a lot, um, structural steel, even in timber frame jobs, you're always going to have structural steel, but what you want to try and stay away from and what the software, the NATO software does not take into account at all is steel that passes from the inside of the building to the outside of the building. Um, here, definitely this, this is going to be a feature steel and that's connected straight to, you know, the steel there, which will go into the structure um, or they might be channels uh, turned out like that as a design feature. Um, 
but they're going to get very cold at night or very hot during the day. And, and, and that temperature is, is going to conduct its way through and into your house. So uh, by all means do this, but, you know, say between this post and, and any internal framing, put a bit of timber if you can, or put some non-compressible, um, uh, non-compressible rubber or something. Talk to your engineer about it anyway. How can you put some sort of thermal break between internal steel and external steel? Um, I've got a camera exactly like this and I swear by it. I think this is definitely, uh, I consider it a low hanging fruit for builders to buy one of these. It's just a little attachment that goes on the bottom of an iPhone in this case. I think they've got them for Android as well. But taking photos of your structures really makes it real for your team. You, they can see why they're doing what they're doing. So, uh, you know, um, it's worth the 300 to $600 or so that you pay for this um, to get an infrared camera. Now, every time you do, do a different type of structure, take some, uh, take some photos and uh, you will improve as you go along and your team will improve and upskill. And it really doesn't take long. I mean, it looks like it's really hard going over all those potential pitfalls. But once you know what you're doing, once a team knows what they're doing, um, it gets just second nature. All right, the last part of walls is, and standard construction is the tightness membrane. Now, if I was doing a passive house, um, you'd be putting a wrap on the inside to stop air going through your wall. Um, for standard construction that doesn't have that, you can treat plaster as a tightness membrane if you know what you're doing and you're trying to achieve that outcome. It's very hard for air to pass through plaster. It does diffuse through slowly, but once you paint that with three layers of acrylic, it's pretty much a, a really good air barrier. And of course, even if you have gaps in your um, in your cladding, even if you have gaps in your membrane, especially at the junctions between wall and ceiling, very hard to stop the gaps. If you have insulated your space as well, and you have a very tight plaster, there's nowhere for air to come through. So if there's no path for air to come through or less path for air to come through, um, the air's not gonna come through. Now, I'm not talking about trying to get standard construction down to 0.6 air changes per hour as per passive house, I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to achieve, uh, and, and this won't, oh, I don't think you can do it. Um, but you don't need to, to achieve the NatHERS rating and the benefits of the NatHERS rating. You simply need to get down below the 10 air changes per hour. And um, I do have a graph, like I said, that I'll discuss that in just a sec. So you, if you're treating your plaster as a tightness membrane, you obviously want to minimize the number of holes through the plaster because this sort of thing isn't going to be a tightness membrane, especially if you have holes on the external wall. Now, if you're a builder building someone else's plans, probably you will have PowerPoints on the external wall. Um, you could talk to clients, try and get them to move things onto internal walls so that the external walls can remain tight or reasonably tight. Um, or you can, you know, next job, talk to the designer. Um, if you're using the same designer and say, you know, can you talk to clients, try and get things, uh, services off external walls. Also, if you've got pipes and a lot of wires in those external walls, it's going to be hard with standard insulation to actually put it in, maintain the lofts and not have it compressed. So if you can um, keep holes, especially off external surfaces. Instead of down lights, again, I would suggest pendant lighting there. Uh, this is just a picture of someone actually putting in some weather stripping on a manhole. Easy to do. Uh, here's one people don't often think about. Steer away from cavity sliders. Uh, I've been into quite a few homes where when the wind's blowing, if I stand next to a cavity slider, uh, I can feel air just gushing out that thing. Because effectively, it's just a hole through the plaster that leads up to the attic in this case. And attics usually aren't very tight, especially if they're tiled roofs. So either avoid these, though I understand sometimes you can't avoid them. And definitely if you're just following the plans, you're just following the plans. But what you can do is you can get some black build, build, builders plastic, builders plastic, and you can wrap um, that socket, sliding socket, tape it up before you put the plaster on. So effectively um, you don't have that hole or it's much reduced. And probably the last bit of plaster advice I'd say is just get some foam. And once again, 
put some expansion foam along that little expansion gap that the plasters leave at the bottom to allow for a bit of movement. Um, and that just stops airflow coming down under the plaster and out underneath your skirting boards. And so you blow in some foam, trim it off. Uh, I take this a little bit further. I also look at pipes, especially ones that go vertically and wires that go vertically between the levels, because I'm trying to stop um, air stratifying or the heat building up too quickly in the upper floor. It will build up anyway, but it, you know, we're just trying to slow it down here. Um, a little bit of spray foam. It doesn't take long um, for the team to do. Another place um, to foam is if you have wires on an external wall, say this was the external wall, and you've got an internal wall abutting it, you probably want to close those holes so you don't get airflow from the externals into the body of the house. It'd be good to just keep it in that wall if you can, or keep the, any, any air movement <laughs> to that wall. Uh, and another thing to make sure that you've, uh, that you've got in place is backflow dampers. Um, a lot of fans, extraction fans these days will come with it. If they don't, make sure that you install these. I, I would always, by the way, be ducting to the outside. Do not duct straight to the roof space with, uh, with the cheap fans. Effectively in your bathrooms, if you're just doing that, you're just putting moist air up onto your insulation. And it's just a, a bad recipe for failing insulation and potential rot and mildew and uh, sick house syndromes, all sorts of things. So duck to the outside uh, and make sure that you've got um, a backflow damper in there so that you don't just get air wishing, swishing it and swashing its way um, through your duct work when you don't want it to. The old adage is, or the saying is, um, ventilate, no, build tight, ventilate, right so this is just sort of following that idea now i won't go into renovations and that's probably a whole nother talk in itself but only to say that renovations just up the onus on the builder to really think about air leakage and really think about weak points in your thermal envelope and a great place to get acquainted with all this material is if you go to the Efficiency Matrix channel. I've stolen this uh, screen grab from one of their YouTube clips, but um, it's a really useful resource for builders and well done Vincent and John for that channel. Um, and uh, we might leave that to one of our uh, builders who do a lot of renovations to um, give a talk on that as well. Here's another low hanging fruit. And like the thermal imaging camera, this is a great one for builders to do for themselves. Not necessarily for the client. This is really to give feedback. Um, and you probably don't want the first time you, you're called on to do a blower door testing to be, you know, when you're, when you're forced to because that's in the contract. You want to know how tight you actually build so you don't get big surprises. And um, so for those people who don't know what a blower door test is, basically they will seal up the, the house and then they'll put a um, basically this fan on the front door and uh, the fan just sucks out air. And then they, using a computer, they measure the resistance of that motor and that tells them how much holes is in your house or how tight your house is. Uh, this is a super activity for a team to get involved in because once they put this thing on, you can physically go around, you can put your hand up to the walls or, or to junctions and you can feel where air is coming in. So it's just another one of those things that makes it real um, for builders where the holes are on site. So I would um, always suggest doing that. And um, if any of my team are listening, uh, we need to do another one soon. It's good to do these things periodically to see how you're going. Question is, how tight should you go? A little bit of a controversial question. Um, well, in, in this talk, how tight you should go is definitely at least, at least two is 10 air changes per hour, right? Because that's what the NatHERS software assumes. It assumes a certain amount of leakage, but it's around about 10 air changes an hour is what it assumes for leakage. Now, the CSIRO um, did some testing of this uh, on new home construction. Um, in 2016, and they tested 20 homes in Melbourne and um, I think the same number in other capital cities around Australia. They found some places like Tasmania did actually pretty well. 
<laughs> places like Melbourne did not do particularly well. And of the 20 homes they tested, uh, I think one um, actually complied. So this is really showing a big underlying non-compliance issue in the industry. So there's a lot of tightening that we need to do with our standard construction. So this knowledge just needs to get out there. When I do have uh, done testing, I'm somewhere around this five air changes per hour, just using standard um, building materials. And I'm sort of seeing this five to 10 as some sort of sweet spot, if you know what you're doing to, uh, to aim for. Of course, um, I can see very much the attraction for Passive House uh, with its air change down here of uh, 0.6 air changes per hour, especially for designs and architects. Um, they don't know necessarily know who the builder is. Um, the good thing about Passive House is that, you know, part of the routine is to test at the end and to use these membranes. So you're very likely to get um, very tight structures. Maybe you won't get the 0 0.6, but you might be up at, you know, one, maybe two, if you didn't do a great job. Um, however, so that's very tight. You're going to be losing, you know, less heat exchange. That's a good thing. Um, However, if it goes too tight, you run into safety issues, potentially. Um, passive house account for this, so don't throw up your arms yet. <laughs> uh, but you need, you, know, you don't want to build up in your house with people breathing and living in the house. You don't want to build up of carbon dioxide. You don't want to build up of methane if you've got gas cooking and stuff going on. You don't want to build up of um, off gas materials, you know, um, VOCs and things. Uh, in your home. So you do want a certain amount of fresh air exchange with the outside. And typically five air changes is sort of a safe limit. Some people say th below three air changes, you have to have ha heat recovery ventilation. That's what this line says, heat recovery ventilation, basically bringing fresh air in um, and uh, transferring some of the heat from the incoming air uh, sorry, to the incoming air as the outgoing air sort of goes out a baffle. I'm not sure you can see my hands doing a, a baffle but uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about um, we Builders Declare did a uh, um, one of these talks on Passive House so uh, check out the YouTube channel on that uh, but if you are below these air, this five air change limit you definitely want to be safe and to have this heat recovery or energy recovery ventilation sometimes it's called as well so but as a general rule, we need to tighten up our structures. Um, if you build with standard materials, but you're thinking about it, you should very easily be able, able to get below this 10 air change hour and comply with your NATHERS rating. Oh, that's a heat recovery ventilation unit. That's what I was talking about. And yes, this was the, uh, the talk that um, Hamish and Jesse did. Uh, so good job, Hamish and Jesse and check that out if you haven't seen it. All right, so we've done all the, the structure now, the, the actual <coughs> walls, the roof, the floor. Windows is probably uh, is sort of the last thing that you've got to make sure complies with what the Nathurs assessor assumed. So how do you know? Well, it should just, be again- Just a heads up, Jeremy, sorry, we, we're just running a little over time. So just to let you know. All right, thanks mate. Um, <laughs> this is sort of the last, uh, the cool. last part of where I'm going today. No worries. <laughs> um, yeah, I see that one minute and nine. Sorry, uh, one hour and nine. Sorry everyone, if I've rambled. Uh, so with your windows, uh, once you've insulated well, you're losing a lot of heat and a lot of energy coming into your house. It's coming through your window. So it's very important to get those right. And so look on your stamped plans, uh, look at the window schedule and it should say on the window schedule what sort of windows have been called up in this case it was the Koenig windows and it should say a U value and a solar heat gain coefficient now it won't look like this this is actually the house energy rating certificate so if it's not on your stamped plans scan that little QR code or get your house energy rating certificate and see what the NG rater called up because that is what you have to meet there are two bits of information that you need to understand when ordering windows. One is this U value and the other is a solar heat gain coefficient. There's actually other things, but these are important things I want to point out here. The U value is a measure of conduction and typically you want a low conducting window because at nighttime for 12 hours a day, there is no sun shining and 
you're just typically in the southern um, states, you're going to be losing heat um, out those windows. So you don't want them to conduct that heat away too easily. You actually want a good R value or a good resistance material. So you're looking for a low U value here and solar heat gain coefficient, that's a measure of how much sunlight is coming through the windows. So typically, as long as you've shaded out the summer sun, uh, you'll typically want a reasonably high um, solar heat gain coefficient. Uh, but when you look at your plans, what you have to order legally, you have to order a window that meets this U value or is lower, has to meet it or is lower, and it's within 10% um, of this solar heat gain coefficient score. So just make sure when you're doing your order for your windows that it complies um, with that. And that way you'll know that your windows comply with the house energy rating. Um, one last thing that the, the NATHERS assumes is, unfortunately, they assume that there are typically no trees unless it has a preservation order on it or it's in a, a, a heritage zone. Um, it won't have, uh, it, it, raters are required to assume no trees because they think trees die off and whatever over the life of the house, but they do have a big effect. So if you are surrounded by trees, I would definitely let your clients know that the rating doesn't assume trees. So it's actually going to perform different from the rating. And it's probably good in that instance to talk to the rater and ask them to actually model it up um, with shading from the trees, just to see what the real performance is likely to be. Um, here we sort of got around it by um, just trimming the lower branches of these trees so that the winter sun can come under them, but it's designed so that the summer sun can give it full shade. So best of both worlds in that instance. And there you go, high performance construction with standard materials, or at least, if not high performance, at least high enough that it complies more or less with the NATHERS rating. Uh, and that way you can achieve this sort of um, performance with a six star or more with seven, eight or nine. Now, next week uh, or next week, next time I do one of these, if you want to hear me uh, again, and I'm sorry I've gone on everyone, we'll be looking at the technology. Do not despair if you only build a six star home uh, builders with the right appliance and technology these days, there have been quantum shifts in the performance of things you can put in the house and that can really make huge impacts into the rest of, uh, rest of the pie there. And uh, with that, I will um, say thank you everyone who has stayed on with me this long and uh, I'll hand over to Simon. Thanks Simon. Awesome, Jeremy. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few questions, uh, a couple of them private messaged, and I'll start off here with Ross. Uh, I'll, I'll only go through two or three just because we have ran over, but um, Ross has asked, how do you go about sealing the wrap to the slab? I'm, I'm sure that he's asked. And would it be bad practice to seal under your cladding against the slab as it would stop the moisture escaping? Yeah, so don't wrap it underneath the slab. I have made that uh, mistake before, trying to do like a starter strip on both ends and uh, you just get water coming in underneath your base plate. Um, luckily, I, I worked that out quite early before the cladding went on and we could just cut it and um, extend it. So your, your foil at the bottom definitely has to go past your base plate. Now, what do I do? I do nothing. I um, just run it past and that's it. And no doubt there will be airflow coming up from underneath my cladding into my wall cavity. However, my wall cavity is, is then uh, possibly a bit tighter than normal because I've taken that time to try and get holes out of my plaster and I've insulated it well. And um, so it's not that you have to be 100% to achieve good outcomes. I really want to get that across, but you need to understand where weak points are and how tight you need to go to achieve the NATHERS rating. Perfect. Does that sort of answer it? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I'll just go through um, one more here. So uh, where was it? Um, do waffle pods act uh, as insulation? Someone yes. Here's 
Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they do. Um, so Waffle Pods, because uh, I think he's asking because Waffle Pods have every, they're 110 millimetres wide and then they have a 110 millimetre um, bit of concrete and it's sort of in this waffle shape. Do they actually act as insulation? So yes, there's conduction zones between the pods and then you go to a pod with very good insulation in a conduction zone. But what the software does, it, it works it out over the whole floor level of what the insulation value of those pods is. So the pod itself might have, you know, 300 mil of polystyrene and some air gaps, you know, it, it might very easily be you know, an, an R4 or something. Um, but once you take into account there's bits without any pod in it that go down to soil level, over the whole floor, it goes down to an R0.7, um, typically for a 300 mil pod. Got you, got you. One more has just popped up. Uh, what do you think about insulating internal walls? Uh, I think it's really great for sound. I, I think it's also good for stopping a, any un, naughty, unwanted um, air leakage that somehow got into your framing system. And it's also good if you've got a cold room, say tip, definitely a garage, you have to insulate off, um, or a, a bathroom or some area that you're maybe not uh, always centrally heating. If there's a different heat profile in a different space, that should be insulated in between. Beautiful, well answered. Pleasure, thank you, Jeremy. I, I think we'll get you back for part two. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> There's plenty of wisdom there. Thanks, so thank I'm... you again, everyone that stuck around. Plenty of knowledge there, hope it helps. Uh, we'll be back, it was clear, we'll be back on April 14th with a presentation from Mark Thompson on sustainable timber, the Australian facts and solutions for the future. Uh, if you want to find out more about Builders Declare, you can email info at buildersdeclare.com. Check out our website, au.buildersdeclare.com. Uh, you can join us on, we've got a Facebook page, Facebook group, Instagram, we're everywhere, where. Uh, people are at the moment these days so thanks again everyone and look forward to seeing you next time thanks jeremy thanks simon thanks everybody <laughs>